90% of your psychology is your physiology, and this means that 90% of your procrastination, distraction, and inability to stay focused during the day has a solution in optimizing your biology and making it work for you rather than against you. So if you are always tired, distracted, and unmotivated, the answer is not in spending more time working and hustling. There is another way, a sustainable way that actually works. Because putting in more hours won't necessarily allow you to get more things done. As Cal Newport tells us in his book, Deep Work, results are not just a matter of time, but a matter of time multiplied by the intensity of your focus. This new way is about working smarter, not harder. It's about building habits that prime your biology for focus and cognitive performance. By working with your human nature instead of against it, you'll be surprised by how far you've gotten with the effort you've put in. It's just like swimming in the sea. If you swim against the current, you'll struggle to get far, even though you're putting in a lot of effort. And on the other hand, if you work with the current, you'll be amazed at your progress. The reality is that we are all working against the current of our human biology these days, in environments filled with distractions and habits that just don't work, which gives you a huge competitive advantage. So today I want to share with you five habits that can save you three plus hours of work a day by allowing you to sustain peak performance and focus all day long through an optimized biology. Habit number one is to oscillate. James Hewitt, a human's performance specialist who works with some of the world's greatest athletes and professionals from Formula One drivers to Fortune 500 CEOs, tells us to treat cognitive work as we would treat physical training. Just like we need to periodize our training into more and less intense periods, we also need to manage our intensity and rest in cognitive work. We all have biorhythms that prime our minds to focus during certain periods of the day, and here is how to make the most out of them. The macro strategy is focus zone. So on a daily level, you want to allocate your most challenging work to your peak focus periods. For more than 80% of us, this is usually in the morning. After lunch, maybe we tend to get a bit tired and distracted, often switching tasks between 1 p.m. to about 4 p.m., and this might change a bit later in the day. You want to pay close attention to when you feel the most alert and focused and allocate your most cognitively challenging tasks in those periods. And on a micro level, what you want to do, we know that for every 90 minutes of work, our brain needs about 15 to 20 minute breaks to sustain cognitive performance during the day. These 90 minute cycles are called ultradian rhythms. We follow these rhythms not only when we are awake, but also when we sleep, transitioning between different sleep stages in a similar way during the night. After 90 minutes, if we don't take a break, our performance begins to suffer. As we mentioned in the video of the three habits that secretly destroy your productivity, most of us push past this point via caffeine or sugar or whatever, but we would be much wiser to recognize this natural limit and take a break instead. Because when we ignore our ultradian rhythms, we experience what researchers call endurance stress. And this is where chronic fatigue, stress, and eventually burnout happen. So cap your work burst at 90 minutes and then take a break of about 20 minutes. You could also adapt this to something like 75 minutes of work with 15 minutes of rest or 50 minutes of work with 10 minutes of rest, which is really easy to implement because it's an exact hour. But the key here is to oscillate. Just as you wouldn't want to see a straight line on a heartbeat monitor, you also don't want your cognitive day to do like a straight line. You don't want to be working at a monotonous level of intensity all day long. So when you're on, be fully on. Be fully focused on one single thing for an extended period of time, avoiding multitasking or switching between tasks. And when you are off, be completely off. This means no information is getting into your consciousness. Avoid checking email or social media or messages during rest periods and instead take a walk, stretch, meditate, or do whatever allows your mind to recharge. Habit number two is to avoid context switching. Attention residue is a phenomenon that occurs when some of our cognitive resources stay attached to a previous task or information before starting a new one. We know that multitasking is a myth that can diminish your performance by up to 40%. So of course, when you're fully focused, you don't want to be switching between context or tasks, and instead you want to become a master at unitasking. On a macro level, you want to have themes for your days, where each day is dedicated to specific categories of work as much as possible. For example, I dedicate Monday and Tuesday to creating these videos. I know that on Tuesday afternoon, I have my filming session and I don't want to work on them during the whole week because I'll have a lot of attention residue, especially since they aren't finished. It stays as an open loop in my head where new ideas and ways to saying things differently can easily cramp up my whole week. And I realized that when I'm most productive, I'm compartmentalizing, I'm containing all the writing and filming of these videos into Monday and Tuesday. And then for instance, Wednesdays are meetings, admin and communications day. 
days. Of course, this will look different to every one of us, but you want to have a notion of the theme for your day or, or even the project you'll be focusing on. The micro strategy is something I call the transition brain dump. So on a micro level, context switching happens in your transition periods during the day. That is when you finish working on something and before you start your next work session. A great strategy when finishing a work session is to quickly journal about what you've accomplished, how you felt, and most importantly, what's the next action in that specific project if there is one. You need to get this information out of your head and into a trusted system if you want to free up the mental space and reduce the chances of your mind wandering back to the previous tasks. Before we move on, if you want to learn how to build this trusted system, how to manage your tasks and events and how to even plan your days, I created a free mini course that will teach you exactly how to do so in the simplest possible way. This course will especially help you if you don't have a productivity system or you don't feel comfortable with your current one. You can access it by clicking on the link in the description below. It's a 100% free so you have nothing to lose. The strategy you can use when starting a work session is to set a clear specific goal before you start working. This is key because you want to avoid the dual focus that we tend to give our brain when we start working on something. What I mean by this is when we sit down to work, we're usually giving our brain two tasks, focusing on what needs to be done and also figuring out what is it that actually needs to be done. For instance, if I were to put in my task manager something like work on video script, I would be giving my brain two tasks instead of one. By putting something like work on X article or study for X exam, work on X project, you are not stating what you will actually do. So your brain needs to first figure out what's the best thing to focus on to work on that particular thing effectively and then focus on doing that task. We want to divide the strategy from the execution and avoid this by determining specific actions before the work session. So instead of working on video script, I would put something like outline video script, write the first draft of the video script, edit and prepare a script for filming. Those are three different tasks. And by figuring out what needs to be done before starting the work session, I free up cognitive resources in a way that increases my chances of getting into a flow state. That state where all your cognitive resources available are dedicated to the task at hand and productivity increases 500%, creativity 490% and learning 430%. Having number three is to be creative before reactive. We know that bombarding ourselves with information decreases our IQ by 10 points, which might not seem like a lot, but it's the equivalent to being stoned or not having slept for a whole night. The habit here is to focus on your most important and cognitively demanding task first thing in the morning for allowing any external information in. This habit alone is saving me about two hours of work a day because what I get done in that focus session before allowing any information in is usually more than what I then get done during the whole day after. And given the fact that 79% of people check their phone and notifications in the first 15 minutes upon waking, building this habit will unlock a huge competitive advantage for you. Because by focusing on your most important task first, you not only ensure it gets done before any distractions come up, but you are also taking advantage of that peak performance state of your brain. Many people, including myself, like to do this not only with work, but also with health and fitness. For example, if my number one goal for today is to film the video you're watching right now, I might be working on that, let's say from 7 to 9.30 a.m. Then I would go and work out. And in a sense, my day starts after that and I'm not available in the morning and I don't care about anything besides my number one cognitively demanding task and my number one physically demanding task. Of course, this would look different to you. You might not be able to do this in this specific way, but try to allocate this cognitively demanding task in a state where not a lot of information has gotten in before. Habit number four is containing your shallow work. James Hewitt also has a cognitive gears model, which divides cognitive work into high gear, middle gear, and low gear, or in other words, deep work, shallow work, and rest. As we've already discussed, when we are trying to focus or rest, we want to avoid the middle ground as much as possible. When working, we are fully on in the high gear with minimal distractions, and when resting, we are fully off without any information getting into our consciousness. However, some tasks, just belong to the middle ground. This is the shallow work that involves a lot of context switching by nature, like processing emails or completing those little tasks that pop out throughout the day. All of these tasks fall into this category because they already have context switching built in. So you want to schedule this admin and communications time for a specific part of your day when you might not feel that focused. For me, it's after lunch between let's say 1 and 2.30 p.m. During this time, you want to work through your emails and messages and admin tasks systematically. And once the allocated time is up, 
you close your email, you close your messaging, you maybe take a rest and return to your high gear work or wrap up your working day depending on when you are doing this. But it is critical to schedule these middle gear tasks because they often serve as a form of procrastination. Statistics show that knowledge workers check their inbox every six minutes or less, which of course is not a great recipe for focus. And by having a dedicated time slot for them, you remove the temptation to procrastinate on your high gear work by getting into the shadow work when the high gear work gets difficult. This model helps us understand that not all tasks are equal and that we need to create clear boundaries between different types of tasks. Habit number five and the last of this video is to follow the 836 rule. Anders Ericsson was a researcher that dedicated his whole life to studying what was behind the most elite performers from athletes, musicians, or professionals. His research is what inspired Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule, which if you haven't heard about, basically states that the best performers in any field have put in the most deliberate practice, <laughs> in this case, 10,000 hours. There is something else that Anders Ericsson discovered that is often not talked about. And in fact, it's the second most important thing they discovered. The best performers slept on average 8 hours and 36 minutes every 24 hours, which of course is much more than the not so best performers. This included about 20 minutes of napping a day. The thing here is that deliberate practice or focus work is hard and you can't sustain that level of attention if you're tired. You need to recharge your batteries when you crash. Now I've been tracking my sleep for over 700 days now with an aura ring and have seen a strong correlation between my sleep and productivity. These days I aim to follow what I call the 836 rule. And if I don't get to sleep eight hours and 36 minutes in the night, I strive to take a 20 minute nap after my admin and communications time. Now you might think this is impossible for your life and it might as well be, but you have to make it a top priority. You have to find creative ways to get closer to this habit. Maybe you find a 20 minute slot, maybe two times in your day. So maybe you take two naps. Maybe you create a wind down routine so that you get to sleep at the time you want. Maybe you turn off your phone at least one hour before your ideal sleep time so that you actually fall asleep at that time. So no judgment here. If you can't or think you can't sleep this amount of time, that's okay. Just know that you will be leaving potential in the table and slowly build the micro habits to get closer to it. Anyway, to recap, the five habits we went through are oscillate, avoid context switching, be creative before reactive, contain your shallow work, and follow the 836 rule. If you commit to even only one of them, you'll see huge returns in your effort. But it is also true that they will work best if accompanied by a solid productivity system. As I mentioned, you have the free mini course available to you. And in case you're already comfortable with your own system and you just want to gather some ideas of the trifecta system, which is the one I teach in the mini course, this video I'll leave somewhere in the screen walks you through it without the specific details of how to sell the calendar and the other tools up. So a big hug and I'll see you over there or in the free mini course or in the next one.